listen to the floor. Welcome back to another pen talk. This talk is going to be vintage, and uh, this is the first review of one of uh, the pens I picked up at the Philadelphia Pen Show uh, last month. I went there looking for vintage, and um, I found some. Yep. Uh, this is a pen that immediately struck my eye when I saw it on the table. I love Waterman's. Um, I have a fair number of Waterman's, but this is a pen that I had never seen before. And it has an identification on it, which is a 92. This color is just outrageously nice. Uh, the red and gold I've never seen before. The color is consistent throughout the the cap and barrel. Just a very uh, small cap band here at the bottom. It has the classic ball riveted clip that Waterman's known for, but the rivets are a little bit different in the their design. And as I did my research, which was not easy to do, I came up with some interesting historical information uh, about this pen, which we'll share as you get into the rest of the video. It has a very clear imprint on the barrel, which is always nice. And uh, I think it's hilarious that they need to identify this as a fountain pen. I don't know what else it could be. I just fell in love with the color. Uh, it needed restoration, but it wasn't uh, anything major. Just a, a basic clean, a new sack, a um, little bit of tuning of the nib, but very little. Nothing I haven't done before with other vintage Waterman's. Just a basic unscrew cap, just uh, less than one turn, and then you have your number two nib, which is one of the reasons, the other th reason why I, I love these pens is these nibs are just excellent. And one thing that's obvious is right away is how long those tines are. So one would expect this to be uh, a nice writer, and it does not disappoint. And it is inked up, as you can see, there's some ink that is sitting on the nib. I just inked it up this morning, so uh, that's not unusual from my perspective. It takes a while for this to, to equilibrate. I was lucky to uh, find this ad in the 1933 Waterman's catalog for the 92. And it does have that distinctive uh, style on the clip where there's a, a little design around the rivets. Nothing printed on the clip, simple lever, gold filled, trim, and I would say that I found uh, the right match for this pen. The color is not going to come out in this reproduced catalog uh, like it probably looked in real life, but that's one of the deficiencies uh, of a catalog. If we look down at the bottom, uh, Waterman was always good at... Uh, putting in a description as to, you know, how they positioned their pens, what market they were going for. So the 92 replaced the 52, and my understanding is obviously the, uh, the last digit stands for the nib size, which is a number two nib, which probably Waterman made in vast quantities and, and various uh, styles. And the nine represents, uh, I'm certain it's a celluloid, um, they don't talk about it. They call it an unbreakable material in snappy yet simple lines. Uh, clips are mounted high. You know, it, it's really an excellent description. And the price was $350. So in 1933, I don't consider this an inexpensive pen. It certainly wasn't competing in the dollar pen variety. So all the pen manufacturers in the 30s, which I consider to be the, the golden age of fountain pens, you know, they started transitioning from your hard rubber ebonite, uh, which are limited colors, to um, different types of plastics, mostly celluloids. Um, and they made their pens in different sizes. So the 92 is the one we're reviewing now, but they also made a 94. And not only was it a different design, a rivet in the clip, a little bit bigger uh, band on the cap, different colors. And this pen cost $5.00 versus 350 for the 92. And a very similar description 
Uh, but this is obviously positioned as a man's pen, which is one of the things that uh, they did a lot with pens back then. Uh, they distinguished uh, the women's pen from the men's pen, uh, primarily on size and also a little bit on style and aesthetics. The 92 and 94 were more the higher end lines, but they still made the 52 in um, hard rubber, and they also made a plastic version of it, uh, the clip changes, and also the lever fill changes. It's still the classic box lever, but uh, this one's more of a rounded, uh, and it's engraved with Waterman, where here's a planar one with more of a spade, like a spoon versus a spade feed. And also how they um, marketed it and described it. So this is a catalog that probably went to the stationary uh, people that were selling the pen. So they're positioning value here. So this is two seventy-five versus three fifty versus of five dollars. So that's how they positioned it. And they still continued to make their classic uh, ripple rubber as three different. Uh, versions of it here, different sizes. Here we see that little banding that they did on the pens to indicate uh, the type of nib that was involved. But you notice this is 650 for this larger pen and 750 for this one. So these are now considered a higher end pen versus uh, the classic black or some of the um, other ones made out of plastic. And in the um, marketing uh, information uh, for the uh, retailers, you know, they're positioning these ripple rubber pens uh, as a preferred pen. I'm certain, you know, they've been now in the marketplace for probably 15, now uh, maybe 12 years, 10 to 12 years at this point in time. Uh, so they're also talking about how the Waterman pens and branding, which was, you know, very important then as it is today. In the 1933 catalog, there's references to the nibs on page 9. So this is page 9 of the catalog. This is positioning the different colored nibs. They used color to designate the type of nib it was. We discussed this a little bit in my number 7 review. And they give a description of each of the colors. And they also talk about other points and... There's the Holy Grail, the Waterman music nib. And also they made an artist nib, which I've not heard about or seen. There may be some of these on some of the pens I have. I don't know whether they were particularly identified as such. So now we zoom ahead to 1936, three years later. And I don't find the um, 92 style that... Um, we showed you in the 1933 catalog or the example that I have in the review. The clip has now changed. The materials have changed. And interesting enough, uh, the price point has stayed the same. And this is also showing the uh, vest pocket or smaller size of the pen in addition to uh, the larger pen. And the promotional um, material is basically positioning these as economical, affordable pens, still having the Waterman, um, you know, characteristics that have made Waterman's probably the number one pen uh, for a number of years during this uh, golden era of uh, fountain pens. So I thought we'd take a look at some uh, real life examples. So these two to the left are uh, classic. 52s. Here we have, um, I would say this is the wood grain model rather than the ripple based on uh, how the pattern is in the hard rubber. You know, it has a nice uh, gold band here at the bottom of the barrel and the classic Waterman uh, riveted clip with the uh, Waterman's uh, logo in it. Here we have that probably the could be the black rubber version that was uh, in the catalog. Very simple, just a nickel trim clip, uh, no band on the cap. As we can see in comparison to the 92, the 52 was a longer pen by, you know, a decent amount. At the same time they were selling the 92, they also uh, sold the number 7, and that's a version of black, which I did a review on. It has a beautiful blue um, kind of a medium metallic nib on it. And next to that is another pen sold at the same time frame, which was an ink view. Had an interesting filling mechanism to it. Um, I haven't done a 
review on that particular pen, but uh, maybe at a future time I will. And here is another version, kind of a Lady Patrician. They called this a number of different things. Uh, it could be a 92V. Um, I haven't looked at the bottom um, to relate that to you. So one of the things that I uh, enjoy about vintage um, is every pen is almost unique. I mean, in many ways, considering the pens are, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, uh, that they still function and, and still look pretty good is uh, in itself amazing and very interesting to me. One of the anomalies uh, of the 92 is the feed. So as we look at uh, at the nibs, you know, they're similar nibs. Uh, the black one is not quite as long in the tines. Yeah, you know, again, these both number two nibs, but they did vary, and, and who knows when these were, how much difference in the time frame when they're manufactured. But when you flip it over and look at the feed, the 92 certainly has a feed I've never seen on a Waterman pen, or I don't think I've ever seen on any pen. So one might think that that feed is definitely a replacement feed. Uh, the one on the right is the classic spoon feed that I've found in almost every other Waterman that I own in this time frame. This may also explain some of the railroading that you'll see in uh, the writing example because that is not the, the regular feed. And maybe at some point in time I might replace it. And as you can see, there's still a little bit of ink creep on the nib. So maybe that feed is, is part of that cause. So obviously... Uh the purpose uh, for my interest in fountain pens and collecting them and studying them is to write with them. Uh, this is one of the inks I picked up at the Philly show. I'm into turquoise inks. So hopefully I'll do a review of all my turquoise. They are quite a variety of uh, colors that are called turquoise. And uh, uh, this is Robert Oster, which I have to admit that I've been very happy with their, fan, their, their inks, like I've been with the KWZ inks. So is, this is, I would say, um, a classic size pen for the ear. It fits well in the hand uh, without posting. It is extremely light. I'll give you those dimensions. But it also uh, posts easily and posts fairly deeply, posts securely. You can feel a little bit of the weight change in the balance when you post it, but it's certainly usable posted as it is unposted. So as I mentioned, this is a classic. That was my fault for not putting any pressure on the nib. I mean, this nib just opens up with uh, the briefest amount of pressure. Can lay down an extremely fine line and with a little bit of pressure really opens up. Um, don't mind this because, uh, like I said, I just inked this up. I really haven't had a chance to kind of use this pen, but I'm very familiar and comfortable with this being representative of, uh, of this era and this uh, type of pen. I mean, this just glides. I think you can hear that along with the dogs moaning in the background. And it, it encourages you to write. I mean, that's what I really think the golden age of fountain pens was all about. People wrote with them. Everybody wrote with them. They weren't just a novelty. They were an everyday use. And, you know, like with everything that people use every day, there were things that you needed to do to distinguish yourself in the marketplace. People wanted to own specific types of pens, you know, for specific reasons. But overall, the, the main example was to write with them. So this is an interesting little, um, you know, history lesson and view, and I really am extremely pleased with being able to acquire this pen in, uh, the, at the show. I did my research on it, and there's not a lot of these pens around, especially in this color scheme and, and with that type of clip on it. So uh, it'll, it'll serve a nice place in, in my collection. Thank you for watching. I apologize about trying to write over the camera. I think many people have talked about that. It's a real pain in the ass to try to do, but I think it's good to give uh, the viewers a kind of first-hand writing experience. So may you have excellent writing experiences. May you have many. May you enjoy all of them. Till later. Bye.